Yes, Richard Weiss is next up yeah, from you, Harvard Medical School. Sure. Can you uh, see my slides? Yep, can I can me? see it. Okay, great. Can you, Sounds good. All right. Okay, great. Well, so in this uh, talk, um, I'll just briefly be um, going over some work that myself and colleagues have done in this space of um, trying to better understand what areas of these healthcare database studies, um, pharmacoepidemiology studies, can we um, use automated data-driven analytics to improve robustness um, of these studies and how we've um, uh, created some R software in this space and uh, implementation of it. Uh, so just to give a quick background before jumping into things. So I think it's pretty much widely acknowledged now that these electronic healthcare databases, healthcare claims, electronic health records can be very valuable for um, supplementing clinical trials to provide real world evidence on the safety and effectiveness of medical products. But of course, using these data sources is challenging. And the primary challenge, um, which really always been the biggest obstacle um, to these pharmacoepi studies is unmeasured confounding, um, selective prescribing of medications due to disease severity, patient prognosis. And so over the last 10, 20 years, you know, pharmacoepi is still a relatively new field. And it's just been over the last few years, that there's been a lot of advancements to improve um, validity and confounding control in these studies. Some advancements related both to study design. Um, for example, the introduction of the new user active comparator study design has had a huge impact in improving the observational healthcare database studies and also a lot of advancements um, with analytic methods for causal inference. There's just been this explosion in the biostatistics and epidemiology literature in recent years of very clever tools that have been developed to try to improve a confounding control causal inference in very messy observational data. And while these advancements have really increased opportunities to improve validity in healthcare database studies, the challenge that we're seeing now is that how do we make decisions? Given the diversity in databases and data structures, there's really no single set of tools um, or a single set of decisions that are optimal across all studies and research questions. And so pretty much out of necessity, um, researchers will have to make subjective analytic decisions between alternative analytic choices. And oftentimes, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't make that much of a difference, but we have seen examples where results can vary meaningfully depending on alternative analytic choices that are made. And so this can result in suboptimal analyses and it can harm transparency, reproducibility, which is currently a big issue in uh, these healthcare database studies. So the question that we've been interested in, um, myself and colleagues, is how can we use automation to improve robustness by reducing as much as possible um, subjective decision-making in these healthcare database studies? Not trying to completely eliminate um, subjectivity. That I think I don't know anybody that thinks that would be a good idea. Um, there's always a need for expert background knowledge, but where can we use automation to reduce, to supplement expert knowledge, to reduce subjective decision-making when it's not needed? And so in thinking about this question, um, you know, if we divide, divide these healthcare database studies up into two phases, the study design phase and then the analytic phase. Um, in thinking about this question, um, you know, myself and colleagues, decisions that are related to the study design phase um, is just very difficult to automate. I don't know if this is really possible. These would be decisions like, of course, what study design am I going to implement? Um, if we're implementing, for example, a new user active comparator design, what active comparator am I going to select to try to minimize confounding by indication? What other restriction criteria am I going to apply to try to further minimize differences between my treatment groups or maximize treatment equipoise? Uh, pretty much every colleague that I've worked with agrees that these are the most important decisions to establishing validity in healthcare database studies, but they're, they're the, also the most challenging to automate. But once we've moved, made these decisions and we've moved more into the analytic phase, we have we've formed our cohorts and we're ready to apply methods, um, you know, analytic methods for causal inference. It's here where we think the automation can be a lot more useful. So these would be decisions like what confounders am I going to select and how am I going to adjust for these confounders? So limitation of traditional approaches to confounder selection is that they've required the investigator to have to specify all factors that could confound the treatment outcome association. And of course, this can work well in a lot of studies. Um, there's a lot of really good studies where this is, is obviously the most widely used approach for confounding control. If there's a very rich understanding of the research question, um, this works just fine. But there are situations where this can be limited. For example, when we have a new treatment that first comes onto the market, it can be difficult to know um, you know, all indications for treatment. And the indication for treatment can also be rapidly evolving during the early periods of the treatment's introduction. But perhaps even the bigger challenge, even if we know all the variables we want to adjust for, um, the bigger challenge in these healthcare database studies is that a lot of the times with the variables, some of the variables we want to adjust for are just not directly measured in these healthcare databases. And so this was talked about in a paper that was published by Sebastian Schneeweiss and colleagues about 10 years ago, where they argued that we really should be thinking differently um, about how 
we think about how these healthcare databases capture information. Instead of thinking of these databases as directly measuring variables that we would want to adjust for, instead we should be thinking of them as containing what they describe as a high dimensional set of proxy factors that indirectly describe, um, indirectly describe the health status of patients. And so what they mean by this, I think is best illustrated in a couple of examples. Um, so for example, frailty is a health concept or variable that we almost always want to adjust for in our healthcare database studies, um, especially if we're conducting studies in elderly populations. But it's a variable that's just not directly measured in these healthcare databases. But instead, we could identify variables that might be indirectly associated with frailty, like uh, long-term use of an oxygen cylinder might um, serve as, at least in part, a proxy for frailty. And that by adjusting for these indirect variables or proxy variables, we can in part adjust away some of the confounding impact of frailty. Another example is healthy users. We almost always want to be adjusting for the healthy user bias. Um, it's not directly measured in healthcare databases, but instead we could identify proxies like health seeking or regular um, checkup visits or number of screening examinations. And so if this is how we should be thinking about how these healthcare databases capture confounder information, the question then becomes is how do we then generate and identify proxy variables for adjustment? Well, again, traditionally, this has just been done manually using expert knowledge, and there's a lot of really good papers out there with algorithms of how to capture information on things like frailty or healthy users. Um, but, but the bottom line is that, you know, it can be challenging enough to know all the variables we want to adjust for, but then if we add on to that another layer of difficulty that some of the variables are not directly measured in the data, so we have to be able to identify codes or constellations of codes that best capture information on these variables, Using expert knowledge alone just does not leverage the full information content that's available in these databases. And so it was here that it was um, hypothesized in this same paper by Shinny Weiss, maybe it's here where we can use automation to supplement expert knowledge to identify proxy confounders to automate this, pre um, this process of high dimensional proxy confounder adjustment. And so that's what they did and they proposed an algorithm to do this. Um, the algorithm was originally developed in SAS. Recently we've, um, uh, created a version in R that's available that can be implemented. And so what the high dimensional propensity score does, it's actually a very simple algorithm. It just searches through the entire database. Um, and for each code, it looks at every single code in each data dimension, inpatient, outpatient diagnoses, um, inpatient procedures. Um, and for each code, it identifies the frequency of occurrence of that code during a defined pre-exposure covariate assessment period. And then it what it's trying to do is capture information on the intensity of the health condition. And then it generates three binary variables based on how frequently that variable occurred. Um, these binary variables are labeled once, sporadic, or frequent. And then with those binary variables, it then ranks them based on their potential confounding impact by just looking at associations between those variables with treatment and outcome. And then it ranks them on one end from the variables that are likely to be the strongest confounders to the other end of variables that are likely to be the weakest confounder. And then investigators will then just select how many of those top ranking variables they want to adjust for in addition to pre-specified variables like age and sex and um, other, other variables. So this HDPS has been very influential in the pharmacoepi literature. There's now hundreds of um, citations where researchers have tried to apply this algorithm to try to improve confounding control in their studies. But there are several limitations. Um, I won't go into all the limitations, but just point out one of the bigger limitations is that it still requires investigators to make a subjective or arbitrary decision of how many of those top ranking HDPS generated variables to control for. And a lot of times it doesn't make much of a difference, but there are examples where you know, results can change meaningfully depending on how many of those variables investigators choose to control for. Um, for example, this is a paper that was published by Elizabeth Portorno. Um, Elizabeth is a pharmacal epidemiologist up in Boston, where in this study, uh, her and her team were interested in comparing two classes of anticonvulsant medications. Um, They're very concerned that um, an, this older class of anticonvulsants was having an adverse impact on cardiovascular risk. And so what they did is, um, in this study, they were very concerned about unmeasured confounding. They were just confident that they were not able to adequately capture all of the confounder information just using expert background knowledge. And so they applied the HDPS to try to improve confounding control. And they applauded the effect estimate as a function of the number of HDPS generated variables that they included for adjustment. So on the left side of this figure, um, they're only adjusting for investigator specified variables, no HDPS proxy variables. And then they gradually added more and more HDPS variables to the adjustment set. And what they found was that the effect estimate changed meaningful enough that it was changing their clinical interpretation of the results. And so this was very concerning to them. 
And this is another example showing a similar story that was published by Jeremy Rassin um, comparing COX-2 inhibitors versus NSAIDs on GI bleed um, that tells a similar story that the effect estimate moved meaningfully depending on how many variables they were adjusting for. And so the work that we've been doing recently is trying to improve the robustness of this idea of high dimensional proxy confounder adjustment by integrating this HDPS algorithm with newer machine learning tools for prediction modeling. Um, when we first got into this space, we thought it would be pretty easy to combine these two ideas, but we quickly learned that it's actually more challenging. The application of machine learning for causal inference is more challenging um, than we thought for several reasons. But still, there have been a lot of the good advancements in this space of the application of machine learning for, predict for causal inference. You know, machine learning has become very powerful for prediction modeling, but the application of machine learning and causal inference is not as straightforward. But still, there have been a lot of good advancements in this space. Um, in particular, there's been a class of methods um, developed that are known as targeted learning that were developed by Mark Vanderland, a biostatistician out at UC Berkeley, where they've done a very nice job of being able to integrate these powerful um, machine learning tools for prediction modeling, modeling within a causal inference framework. And so we reached out to Mark and his team and um, asked if we could collaborate on several projects of trying to integrate these two ideas. Um, Mark and his team being that, you know, theoretical experts in biostatistics and, um, you know, they were very helpful in helping us to integrate these two ideas. And so this resulted in a series of projects where we were able to extend the HDPS algorithm with some of these targeted learning and machine learning tools. Um, my time's about up, so I think I'll end here um, and just say we've developed our software um to implement these tools um before i give uh references for where that our software can be located um just a couple of things to sum up is that we did find in our work in applying these tools across several simulations and empirical examples that it, it you know on average in general it does improve robustness of this high dimensional proxy confounder adjustment um, but still no single alg algorithmic approach was optimal or uniformly best across all studies. And so this still remains a challenge. Um, it does improve upon what we previously had, but it's still not a perfect solution. Um, and then finally, just want to emphasize that, you know, in this discussion, our, you know, we've been trying to, I've been emphasizing the need to reduce subjective decision-making in these pharmacoepi studies, but I want to emphasize that, you know, I'm, we're, we don't advocate for completely eliminating um, the need for expert background knowledge in these studies. Expert knowledge is always going to remain a key component in these healthcare database analyses. Um, here's the uh, location to the software um, for anybody who's interested. Um, hey, we're one minute overdue now. Thank you. I'm done. Hey, we're one minute over, yeah. Great. That's a really good presentation. Um,